Welcome back, everyone. Now we'll begin with our panel discussion and souvenir publication on youth and radicalization. Uh, you have already seen his film, but again, I would like to introduce you to a very senior and eminent journalist, Mr. Rahul Chandavarkar. He will be moderating the panel discussion. And so thank you very much for bearing with me. And the further program will be handled by Mr. Rahul Chandavarkar. Please give a big applause for Rahul Chandavarkar. Thank you, Vedan. Uh, Vedant and uh, his other colleague, Harshad. Where is Harshad? He's setting up the Ah, see, that's the thing. The two of them have been absolute busy bodies in this uh, festival so far, and I think they, they're not, I don't think they sleep either. So they've been, they've been here all the time and doing multiple roles, so very, and, and they, plus they acted yesterday. So it gives me great pleasure. Really, I feel very privileged to moderate this panel. Thank you, Ranga. Ranga has to pay attention for this. Yeah, sorry. I, I'm thanking you for uh, giving me this uh, privilege to moderate this wonderful panel discussion. There, there is a souvenir there that we are going to be releasing shortly. And I had the great honor of uh, and the privilege to edit that souvenir. And most of the people on the panel have actually written articles in the souvenir. So uh, I have the little advantage of having read and reread the article several times, you know. So. So I, I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, going to invite the panelists onto the dais and going to give a short introduction to each one of them. So you know where they are coming from, who they are, and you know, so you get a background. So I will uh, start by with the with the ladies, uh, Shanti D'Souza, um, and and uh, Shanti is uh, uh, a doctorate from the Jawaharlal Nehru University, the famous JNU. And um, uh, while she is a doctorate in international relations, she is uh, a conflict and terror researcher and an expert. So uh, especially on the Afghanistan, Pakistan, the AFPAC region, you know. So she has spent extensive time in places like Kabul and uh, we'll be uh, very privileged to listen to her. So I invite Shanti to come on the desk. And, and uh, I'm going to request uh, Vibhavari to felicitate Shanti. <laughs> Next, it is uh, um, Kirsten. Yeah, and, and Kirsten is from uh, um, the D House uh, Dusseldorf, the very big grips. Um, a theater organization in Germany, and we're very privileged to have her here. She is, in fact, uh, what they call in German, German uh, a dramaturg, uh, but uh, in our parlance, she is somebody like an admin director who looks after that entire institution. So the wonderful plays that they do in Dusseldorf, and one of their productions is there tomorrow, the, the play uh, Parodies or Paradise. And that's all thanks to uh, she and her team, you know. So I invite her to come on to the desk. I would then like to invite, um, I'll, I'll speak about uh, Arun Waklu. Arun Waklu is a leadership coach based in Pune. Um, he is, uh, um, besides being a leadership coach, he's got in, in our Indian parlance, those blue chip degrees because he is um, an IIT, IIM and, and TAS, you know, Tata Administrative Services. Many, many years ago, he taught me organizational behavior in my B school. <laughs> so we've been friends from the 1980s. So um, Arun has been um, quite a peacenik, really, because he has organized uh, Indo-Pak people-to-people peace dialogue, then a Kashmir people-to-people -people peace dialogue, and, uh, and uh, very successfully. So Arun, please come on the desk.
Um, next is uh, Lutz uh, Hubna. Lutz Hubna is uh, a very um, you know popular playwright from Germany. It's the play that uh, he has written, which is going to be staged tomorrow. Uh, parodies. Now, uh, the interesting thing is, Srirang Godbole, Vibhavari Deshpande, and Lutz uh, together worked on this concept of uh, youth and radicalization. And that's how we had Why, the play that we watched yesterday in Marathi, and parodies that we are going to watch, parodies or paradise in English, that we are going to watch tomorrow. Um, he has been associated with the Grips Theatre movement, and uh, presently, he's been doing a lot of good work across Germany. So, Lutz. Finally, uh, the youngest of the panelists, <laughs> so I kept Khalid for the last. Khalid is, uh, Khalid Shah is, um, uh, you know, very uh, exciting, uh, uh, you know, what is it, panelist for us because he comes from Kashmir and uh, he's born and brought up in Srinagar. Uh, he's been a journalist who's uh, uh, seen, uh, reported the conflict, the ongoing conflict from close up front and he's presently a um, uh, senior research fellow with the, the Observer Research Foundation in Delhi. And he is, because of his background, is uh, uh, constantly uh, researching the conflict in Kashmir. So, Khalid. So, we'll, we'll start now. I'll, I'll just take my seat too. I also welcome Rahul Chandavarkar and thank you very much for moderating this discussion. Hello. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? This works? Yes. Okay. So, uh, before we begin, we are going to really uh, uh, release the souvenir that I just spoke about, you know. It's the festival souvenir and uh, all the people on the, the dais today have contributed articles which uh, are uh, very, very well written and articulated. So, I will request uh, all of them to pick a copy each. Thank you, uh, everyone. So, um, I'll, I'll begin. Uh, what we are really going to do is, I'm going to give each of the panelists a chance to uh, speak on a certain topic that they have either written in their article or uh, from their field of interest. We will then ask them about um, what, are, what kind of solutions are really there to fight radicalization. And then we'll come to the audience because by then, I am hoping that the audience has some interesting questions to ask any one of them. Um, I think there will be a mic that will go on to the audience. They can. So I'll actually begin. I'll, I'll kickstart with uh, Arun. And uh, I must tell you, very, very interesting uh, feature of Arun's life has been um, that Arun's parents, we are now, the topic is clearly youth and radicalization. So uh, Arun's parents back in 1991, had been kidnapped by the Hezbul Mujahideen. And this was the early years of the, um, what is it, militancy in Kashmir. And uh, they used to uh, live in Srinagar. And uh, his father uh, was the principal of an engineering college. And uh, his mother um, uh, later on was a politician. She, she was an elected MLA uh, in, in uh, the Kash JNK uh, assembly. So, but they were kidnapped and they were kidnapped for a good 45 days. They were in custody for 45 days. So, I want to ask Arun to recount a bit of that, uh, what impact it made on the family and how his parents actually communicated with the young uh, militants. Okay, thanks. So, thank you, Rahul. Uh, just before I respond to your question, I thought I'll just give a little context before I say anything. So, as a resident of 
Kashmir and as a person who's observing what's happening there, I think what I've seen is that peace is underlying everywhere. It's not as if peace has to be got from somewhere. Peace is really the default condition of humanity. It's like the sun. But sometimes clouds overshadow that. You know, clouds of uh, erroneous thinking, clouds of all kinds, and then you find that peace has disappeared. So in a sense, I think the task is really to find a way to clear away the clouds and see how the sun of peace can come again. Now coming to your question, I think the one thing I can say uh, from that experience was that uh, if you have faith in humanity, if you have faith in the intrinsic humanness of each human being and you reach out to that with compassion, with understanding, with listening, you find you can build bridges even in the most severe of conditions. So we've sat with so-called militants, they sat with them, they ate with them, dined and so on, and build bridges of compassionate listening, compassionate understanding, and slowly the clouds of radicalization, the clouds of erroneous beliefs disappeared and that led to uh, their release subsequently. So I would just summarize it by saying that uh, look beyond the obvious, look beyond the external clouds, look straight to the heart of human beings and you will find peace there, you will find humanity, you will find compassion there, even in the most hardened of militants, in the most hardened of conditions. I'd like to just say that for now. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Arun. Um, I'm sure you're like, you got a perspective of what, you know, um, his family went through. I have, I'll, as we are uh, still discussing Kashmir, I'll go to Khalid. And uh, Khalid has written uh, in the souvenir, when you get a chance to read it, Khalid has written a very, very lovely piece, lovely article. So there is a place where he uh, quotes uh, the author Tariq Mir. And uh, Tariq Mir in an article has written, uh, which has been quoted by Khalid, that the shift, Khalid, the shift from uh, the Sufi religious belief that used to dominate much of Kashmir to this more radical Wahhabism, as you know, Tariq has said. Um, do you think that really is one of the major factors for fanning this, you know, um, uh, what is it, uh, interest in militancy among the youth of uh, Kashmir? Well, firstly, uh, yes, uh, there is a, a radical shift, uh, as I may want to call it, in the way the faith is being practiced uh, and the way the theology of the faith is evolving in Kashmir. Uh, you know, our grandfathers used to have a very Sufi way of uh, practice. And in my opinion, uh, that, that syncretic culture of uh, unity and diversity in a sense, uh, and if you want to deconstruct it further and go through the layers, it's basically you know, multiple societies, multiple ethnicities living together, even though they may come from different uh, religions and sharing uh, what I call ideas, beliefs, rituals, day-to-day uh, 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 -day, uh, activities in a society. That syncretic culture is in a way a bulwark against the radicalization and what has happened in Kashmir is that we have gone uh, to a very hard faith and that hard faith has now uh, changed the hearts and minds of people so much that you have a 14-year-old before conducting a Fidai strike coming and telling you, I've heard the call of jihad and this is what I stand for and you must follow me. And the society doesn't have a way to respond. First, the society really cannot fathom or cannot answer the question as to why a 14-year-old or a 16-year-old is heeding to the call of jihad. So it's a social problem because the society is totally unaware of what's happening or is giving a tacit sanction to whatever is happening. Number two is a case of parent parental sanction and intervention. I mean, uh, I've come across cases like where young boys went to militancy, they were footballers, some came from good colleges and universities, who after the intervention of the parents were able to come back to mainstream. But there have been cases of parental sanction as well, where a militant who is trapped in an encounter makes a last phone call to his father, and the father says that I have 
given you on in the in the path of god and you must die you must not come alive i don't want to see you come back alive so that in a sense tells us that there has been a significant shift in the way uh, people first think of religion and their interaction with the religion and the society and there may be various reasons for it there's not just one reason i i i believe uh, uh, it's very difficult to uh, pin down on one particular aspect of the problem and as i told you the syncretic culture as it keeps changing i think the first and foremost uh, reality of kashmir is today that my generation millennials we haven't seen a hindu in our life the first time we see a hindu in our life or we see a totally opposite system uh, or a opposite belief system in our life is when we move out of kashmir and since we live in a monolithic narrative that we uh, are the only ones that exist and if you look at the geographical uh, disposition of kashmir we are kind of you know locked by mountains and we have, we have a very little interaction to the outside world contrary contrary to what it used to be earlier so we are becoming more and more inward and we are, we are becoming more and more monolithic as to how we see us ourselves and how the world sees us and that coupled with a very uh, toxic narrative which tells us that oh we are the supreme beings and we are ultimately going to have a kind of a a, a a a supreme command on or let's say a moral righteousness on how we see the world that i think pulls youth towards a radical part but that's not the only thing the other thing is that it's the disposition of a particular person in a society as to why a society is a certain way in a conflict and that in itself goes to the roots of the conflict how the conflict has evolved in last 30 to 40 years and how that is in a sense dismantled the existing societal orders like the first societal order as i said of a syncretic culture the second societal order that we had that is that we had large families where young kids would be taken care of parents extended uh, uncles aunts grandfathers their relatives and there was a wide safety net for the youth uh, which uh, kind of was in a sense a control and in a sense a learning system for them uh, to proceed forward in life that second number third is that we have to understand in jammu and kashmir is that i have studied around 200 300 cases of these boys who join militancy there is not one or two who come from madrasas unlike what we see in afghanistan they're not coming from madrasas they're not coming from a religious uh, school they're coming from the modern education system that in itself is a commentary on the nature of the uh, education system that it's not uh, in a sense making or educating people or training them forward in future to a society which is going to be a lot more uh, harsh on them because of the reality they live in number third that i have found out is that most of the militants come in the age group of 15 to 25 and uh, quite contrary to what was happening previously we have more and more teenage boys who are 14 15 years old 16 years old who may not even understand the idea or the or if if i may say the political goal of what they're trying to do they may not even have a total uh, understanding or a comprehension of this political goal is but they do believe that this is a righteous path and they do believe in that this is a right path for them so somewhat all of these uh, kind of ideas they come together towards making a radical is it it's not just it's it's in a sense a failure of the political system as well because that political system is not channelizing uh, the angst or the anxieties of these kids so all of that in my opinion is getting uh, uh, is getting uh complicated is getting compounded into a complex problem where uh, we have right now at the moment there is an ideological tussle between the militants itself the pro pakistan groups and the so called uh, global jihadists who prescribe to the ideologies of al qaeda and uh, islamic state are fighting amongst each other and uh, and it's it's a sense of an ideological fight as to who's right one end the uh, uh, groups which are pro pakistan uh, well, they're saying that oh we are fighting for a political cause and that 
maybe to accede with Pakistan or a separate Jammu and Kashmir. The other is saying that we don't believe in the idea of a nation state. We don't believe in India and Pakistan. These are immaterial for us and we believe in the idea of an Islamic state. And these two groups are now uh, in a kind of a tussle between uh, each other and they're grappling for space. And that ideological tussle, in my opinion, is what's going to define the relationship of the relationship and internal relationship of Jammu and Kashmir, its society, and its interaction with the outside world. And that has a, a, a very significant overbearing on the political aspect of the conflict. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Khalid, for that very comprehensive explanation. Um, while we are on this topic, I want to invite Shanti to uh, tell us about uh, how different it is in Afghanistan vis-a-vis what Khalid was saying in Kashmir, you know? Mm -hmm. How are the youth in Afghanistan getting into militancy? You could share with us. Well, I think it's an interesting case study, uh, both Kashmir and Afghanistan. And since I've done a bit of study on Kashmir, <coughs> particularly on the surrendered militants, I think I agree with Khalid's broad observations. Now, coming to Afghanistan per se, if you look at the youth, uh, one thing one, you have to keep in mind is that Afghanistan is going to experience a youth bulge very soon. That means there is a significant number of young people in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and these are unemployed youth. They don't find jobs, they, are, they don't find access to education, and they don't find access to justice. Now, I, I want to give you a broad context about how Afghanistan is today. And here, again, there are interesting parallels with Kashmir. It was a traditional society. Uh, because of decades of wars, so almost four decades from the Soviet intervention till date, that the traditional structures have been broken down and they have nothing to fall back on. So they don't have that social net which existed before. So the youth today are exposed to a lot of pressures. So on one hand, it's true that those who are educated uh, in modern schools also get radicalized, as Khalid pointed out, and that happens in most of the cities, uh, modern cities as we see. But in Afghanistan, what is happening is since they don't have access to formal education, they actually go to madrasas in Pakistan where they are indoctrinated and they come back and, come, and they are ready to commit suicide. Now, this is something very contrary to the Afghan culture because they don't kill themselves. They've always been proud Afghans. But today that tr uh, trend has changed and we have seen that from 2005. And how did this change come about? It was the war in Iraq. Th these people have learned from other theaters and Iraq was one experience which actually uh, encouraged Afghan youth to take on to suicide form of terrorism. And this was new. And more interestingly, it was just not the men, it was also the young uh, women and children who are getting into this. And uh, this is a very dangerous trend and that's not really been addressed. The second is on the whole factor that you have this tremendous amount of young people who don't have access to justice. This tremendous anger in Afghanistan today against the international intervention. And why is that? It's not that the international community hasn't done things there. They've spent a lot of money. There's a lot of blood and treasure spent in that country for the last 18 years. And US has spent considerably. But still, they're facing the backlash for the fundamental reasons that the civilian casualties or the civilian deaths in Afghanistan has increased. In an Afghan society, which is very traditional and tribal at certain level, killing one member of the family amounts to revenge. So you have 10 people taking up arms to avenge the death of that one family member. And thereby, this kind of radicalization and this kind of anger has increased to such an extent that there is this religious idiom being used of driving away the infidels, that is the foreigners, that is the Americans and the rest of the international community today, which the Taliban has used to its advantage. So if what we see from the media is that the Taliban is ready to come for peace talks and they're going to sign a peace deal is true, it's just because of the fact that the Taliban are not really winning. It's just because the fa fundamental fact remains is that there is anger in Afghanistan, which the Taliban have been able to channelize and which the Kabul government has not been able to address. Now, if you look at the government in Kabul, it looks like a more of a government which has been installed by the international community to run a country without having any authority. I have worked in the ministries uh, in Afghanistan and I know how it functions. So basically the money from international community comes in but goes through contractors and subcontractors to the international community itself and just doesn't get invested in Afghanistan. 
So the government has no say on matters per se because it doesn't come to their budget. So since the government doesn't have money, there is no legitimacy and there's no action, uh, there's no accountability per se. So the general resentment of the youth and the people against the central government in Kabul is also increasing. And this is one of the external factors which is driving these people towards joining these groups. And interestingly, as you pointed out uh, what, in what, what's happening in Kashmir, it's also happening in Afghanistan and Pakistan, the advent of Islamic State. Uh, Islamic State after losing its territory in Syria is looking at other theaters and AFPAC is the platform they are looking at. So there is this ideological battle or the operational battle which is being fought by the Taliban and the Islamic State at the moment. And the Islamic State is more radical. It's true that the Afghans don't want to join the Islamic State. But the Taliban are not able to keep them in the hole because now they are ad uh, advancing towards a peace talk and getting into the government or getting into the society in Afghanistan. So there is this youth which is being weaned away by the so-called Islamic State to fight. And thereby the problem of radicalization has increased and will remain uh, for decades to come because the fundamental issues, uh, which I'm sure that you'll uh, ask about in the next round of questions, have not been addressed. To put it broadly, in Afghanistan, as you look at it, one, it's the function of the state. Second, the societal structures which have been broken down. The third is the economic factors which are driving people towards this because it's a form of revenue. Fourth, it's also psychological because there's tremendous amount of war uh, impact that these people have faced and a significant number of youth have also taken on to drugs and that's another serious concern in Afghanistan. And fifthly, it's also the fact that the youth do not have any alternatives there today. Uh, what you see in the media is more of the people who have come from abroad, who are like the diaspora, who have taken on the important jobs in Kabul. But for the ordinary Afghans, the opportunities are very few. And with the announcement of exit and the peace deal and all of this, the concern and anxiety has increased among Afghans. And Afghans have always been a, fe a fence sitter because in a conflict situation, that's what you do. Uh, they have to look for opportunities, and they are looking at opportunities, that is, to be with the Taliban at the moment. And not because they support the Taliban, it's because they are left with no much option. I think I'll stop here and take as we have more questions. Thank you. Yeah. No, thanks, thanks, uh, Shanti. I'll bring in Lutz into the conversation. Um, I've come <clears> very well. yeah. If it's working. So, yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Is, is that working? Lutz's voice? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, Lutz has written again in the souvenir a very fine article, and there's a portion where he says um, to look inside the head of a terrorist. I found that very interesting, you know, where in his play, tomorrow, uh, I hope, you know, I urge all of you to come and see that play. In Paradise, the, the protagonist is Hamid. And he talks about, as a playwright and director, he talks about looking into the head of a terrorist to figure out what is going on. So, Lutz, can you tell us what you really mean by looking into the head of a terrorist? You know? Yeah. Uh, what you have to decide as a playwright is always um, what issue, what burning issue do you want to talk about? And the first step was to, to, to say, we want, we establish it together to uh, talk about youth and radicalization. And I think every country has its own form of radicalization. So what you're describing has sometimes the same things going into radicalization, but the German situation is a different one. And we wanted to write about homegrown terrorists, how they are called. So about people who are living in the Western society uh, and have a point where they meet the wrong people and sometimes in a very short time uh, drift into, uh, I want to do a suicide bombing or I want to go to Syria. We had over a thousand uh, um, boys and girls going to Syria. And when we started with that, this was really a kind of radicalization, which was a burning issue in Germany, uh, not only because of these young people leaving, but because of that a lot of people mixed up Islam and Islamistic things. So we wanted to write about uh, what really is the difference between that and that the Islamistic people are the most threatening for the liberal uh, Muslims. So it's not a fight against the white people, it's a fight against the own Ummah, how it is called. Uh, 
And very soon we found out that that's not interesting just to tell the story of how a guy slips into that because then we know don't do this and this was the reason. Uh, it's quite more interesting to build really a round character to find out what is interesting for that young guy. Why is he doing that? What is his expectation? Uh, it's not that point of that he's getting into a wild animal. It's a point is that there is a wake um and what brings uh, Islamistic or Salafistic uh, ideology into these young people. And for that, we decided to put it in a kind of a brain cinema. So we wanted to look inside the head and the whole show is inside the head. Here it's a club. Uh, inside the head, what's going on and what are the problems just, just to find out uh, uh, where do they go to and what, what they have done maybe 20 years ago. And we, we had the theory in our play uh, that uh, Islamistic, uh, the Islamism is a kind of a pop phenomenon. So we tried a, a counterpoint and just not to think about what have they read in the Quran because most of them haven't read the Quran. They just have a, Iran for dumb, uh, a Quran for dummies. So they have just some pe things they have from YouTube. So uh, that point of religious or faith is not so interesting for the German uh, Islamistic people. It's more that point of you go somewhere, you have a sex slave, you have a gun, you're in a war and you are the guy with the big balls. Uh, and what was it in the 60s? So we just tried to find out what could be compared to that. So it was more a story about uh, uh, why is it so interesting for young people, specifically in Germany, mostly with a migration background, uh, to go there. Because it's not so easy to have that as a, they are discriminated, they're poor, because often these are middle class kids. So they have a job, they have a family, everything's working, and nobody really knows what goes on. But there must be something, uh, there must be something where there is a lack of values or, or morals or a system where they can, can deal with. Uh, and for example, for the girls who go there, it's often uh, they want or they, may, they, they seduce them with uh, go where the men are men, there you can be a woman, a real woman. It's, it's often a point of the world is too complex. You can go somewhere where you are, whatever you do uh, is something God wants from you. So you're always right. You never make a mistake. So it's more that point of uh, uh, under complexity compared with being in an adventure. And after that, uh, faith starts or, or uh, talking about the Ummah or I, we have to fight for the Muslims in the world and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so it's, it's another point of looking to that story and that's why we chose the brain because it has a lot to do with how do you deal with your family and with your life and the sense you're so searching for your life. Thank you, Lutz. I'll bring in uh, Kirstin. Kirstin, I wanted to ask you because of the kind of play that has been, you know, um, produced. Um, what kind of impact has parodies have had on the German youth, you know? And I mean mixed uh, people with, uh, what do you call it, uh, different ethnicities in Germany people coming from the Arab world as migrants. And has that, uh, ha have you all got documented any feedback since the play has been staged? Well, first of all, the D-House is a very big theater in Düsseldorf and we have like m very many spectators in, in uh, more, more than many hundred shows a year in different plays. So I just counted, uh, 10 minutes ago, I think, since we staged this play two years ago, about, not almost two years ago, I think it's already 10,000 people that saw it in Dusseldorf. And it also was invited to some other places. So this is a num quite a number you can work with. Um, so it spread very widely. But uh, the, um, uh, the reason why we put it in our program is, of course, that we are more than one piece. We are many pieces on a uh, place. And we are many uh, programs around. This is what you asked me earlier before we went here. So um, I thought of um, things in uh, the German constitution that might help to the question that you put to me earlier, what impact theater can have on all these political questions. So the Germans after the Second World War gave, gave themselves uh, a constitution that is in this year going to be 70 years old. So there are a lot of moments that we think about and one of the first um, abstracts is uh, that the dignity of any human is untouchable. 
So we can think about this. Is it untouchable or not? So do we really integrate everyone that lives with us? So who is society? Who is a citizen? Who is not a citizen but living in our society? So all these questions lead us to many questions that might find a path um, when we wonder how people can radicalize themselves and attack our society. So in the first moment when attacks happen, we think, what do they do to us? So we separate, but actually we are one society. That's what we try to think about in our theater. Um, what did the us do to have some people become another us? So this is a question. Then we have um, another um, little part in our constitution saying that, um, so please excuse my English, I try to describe because many words are missing. Um, that the politics and education must not overwhelm people, uh, meaning um, that we have to be neutral in these f things. Uh, we have to think from every side about a problem or an issue, which is very important. We need this. And as I said, this constitution was done after the Second World War, so the Germans really knew why they put this into constitution. But they also put a third thing I want to mention today in the constitution, and that was the freedom of the arts. And we have nowadays an approach of politics to the arts and to theater coming to us and saying, we have to be neutral, and we now feel that coming to questions of radicalization, being neutral doesn't lead us anywhere anymore. So of course, we need to educate the people. Everyone is fine with that and we need to talk about politics. But all these radical questions are emotional questions. And so we are really actually kind of astonished that uh, we can do something that adds up to all these other very important fields saying that uh, with a, a stage play we can reach the people via their emotions and through the stomach come to their head and uh, find a way to express themselves. And so we try to make a floor, make, uh, create a space where everyone can say what he or she thinks, to put it on the table and to talk about it. So, and this we do with Paradise, which we played very often, and we were also um, happy that the Ministry of the Inner approached us and asked us, can we put your play in our program? So actually they deal with um, radical people, putting them into court and things like this, and they said we want to work f before that, we want to reach especially young people, so um, can we um, make advertise for your play and we didn't know we said yes you can and so we had very uh, different experiences with it but one thing that was important for us that uh, the the more you feel comfortable with your religion you you can watch this play which is in a, i think Lutz Hübner style also very sarcastic so it has a, a biting humor in it um, and of course, there is, um, there is diverse meanings to this. So there's people during the play, maybe in the first moment, feeling attacked by the play. And, and then coming together, so another point was that we d never do the play only, but it's always a talk, a little talk added in the end. And this adds up to uh, something that we do every Monday. We, we open the door, everyone can come into the theater without paying, and there's soup and water and tea for everyone. So, so this is every single week on Mondays, we open the space, create world cafes to talk and things like this. And of course, we have much more plays um, about other issues of radicalization. Yeah, Th thank you, uh, Kirsten. Um, you know, this, uh, if, you, if you really heard her closely, what Kirsten was saying, what I found very interesting in what you said in the later part of your um, explanation was that the uh, government of uh, the government in Germany has actually uh, invited them or taken permission to use their play uh, to uh, kind of communicate with uh, uh, people who have been in custody. You know, I mean, who have who have been either arrested for something suspicious. Uh, you know, by the police and all that. So that's very interesting, I found, you know. So on that line, uh, Arun in his article has mentioned something very interesting about intervention. I'm coming to the issue of intervention. 
and um, Arun mentioned uh, experiments in Belgium and Denmark. You know, so uh, of how the Danish uh, government and the Belgian government have started intervening to kind of uh, you know keep the keep the youth away from getting radicalized. So I want Arun to kind of share that with us. You know. So I think one of the things uh, we must have understood by now is that it's not a simple matter. There are many, many dimensions. There's a dimension of uh, propaganda and, you know, people pushing things into the minds of young people. There are social issues, us versus them. As Shanti said, there's this whole thing about the, uh, you know, economic dimension, which is also true in Kashmir. There's also a huge part to play with education. Like, for example, the age of 12 to 18 in human development is the age of will, when even normal teenager will resist and fight and all that, and is looking for adventure. Now, if he doesn't have avenues of adventure in uh, the normal channel like sports and social service and all that, he does drugs or radicalization or going off to Iraq or whatever. So there are many dimensions, including poor governance, whether it's Kashmir or uh, Afghanistan. I think definitely poor governance makes you very, very angry, it makes you upset. I am not a radical, but I also get very, very angry sometimes because of the injustice. Now, coming back to uh, this place, Michelin in Belgium and Aarhus in Denmark, what they did is that they made a social intervention to look at potential youth who might be getting radicalized, who are potentially vulnerable to radicalization and involving them in communication, in youth, youth houses where they can play, they can meet, they can, you know, have sports, involving the police, involving society, connecting them together, having conversations because at the root of it all, it is a question of changing the minds of people. If a mind has been switched in one direction to get it back or to prevent it from going there, you need to change the mind. And how do you do that? Through connection, conversation and communication. So in these examples, Rahul, there is a lot of communication in society. There is the parents, the teachers, the education, NGOs, the police, all of them getting together as a community to look at what is the issue and make a person feel included. And I think that sense of wholeness, that sense that I'm not an alien, I'm wanted, I'm, I have people talking to me, listening to me, has made a huge difference in Michelin in Belgium and Aarhus in Denmark. I think I would just like to underline one simple thing, and that is the importance of compassionate communication. Uh, Three quick examples. In the Indo Park thing that we mentioned, we had generals who had fought with each other on the border, sitting across and listening to each other. We used World Cafe, we used open space technology to just get people to listen to each other. Right? And before you knew what's happening, the generals are dancing together, former militants are sitting together and making decisions because for once they felt heard, they once they felt included. Example number two, I think I shared about my parents that when they were in custody, again, compassionate listening, understanding, sharing. And the third one, very, very recently, we got children from Pune to talk to children in Pakistan using Zoom. And the children were talking about compassion. What are you doing about compassion in Pakistan? What are you doing about compassion in Pune? And at the end of it all, a little girl from Pakistan, Karachi, Khorogoth, Karachi, said, but you're like us. You're exactly the same as us. I said, well, 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 why did you think otherwise? He said, because we are told in Pakistan that Indians are violent, they're evil, uh, they are not to be trusted and so on, right? In another similar conversation, a girl from India is asking a little girl in Pakistan, you look so peaceful, how come? They said, we, every day we have silent, quiet time in Karachi. That's what we've been taught. We are a Montessori school. So what we found is these children with open minds, with compassionate communication, actually vowing that this narrative is all nonsense. The adults have got it all wrong. We are going to lead and create a new narrative. And this is going to go on. Now, many other schools have joined up for this 
and we intend to take it to many, many more schools. Communication, connection, listening, understanding, and you find that very soon, you find humanity in the other. And I just conclude with a quote from the Dalai Lama. He says, the 20th century was a century of violence, us versus them fighting. Let's make the 21st century a century of dialogue, a century of understanding and communication. And I think that's the key, community, communication, compassion. Yeah, thank you, Arun. That was lovely, you know, you sharing uh, insights into what's happening in uh, uh, Europe and more closer here uh, between school children. Um, Khalid has mentioned in, uh, in his article how um, education is the key, among other things, but he stressed on how education has failed, the present education system uh, has failed uh, in, with, with particular reference to Jammu and Kashmir um, to really not being able to control uh, this, you know, move towards militancy. So, Khalid, I urge you to tell, to tell us why you are saying so and, you know, what do you have in mind? Uh, so, firstly, uh, the education system, in my opinion, uh, in a modern world is meant to train, the pedagogy is meant to train you for a future life. It's not meant to train you only to gain skills to be an engineer, but it's also meant to teach you how to survive in the society and how to make the best out of the world. When the education system fails to convince a person to live, you know that there is something horribly wrong out there. Now, if you take a very simple example, Burhan Wani, who was one of the first militants or terrorists, whatever you may want to call it, whichever way your politics floats, you can call whatever you want to. Uh, if you look at it, he was an educated young man. Okay. At the age of 17, he becomes a militant. His father is a teacher. And you would love to understand is that how does a teacher's son become a militant? There's something horribly wrong there because a teacher in a society will hold some respect and some control even beyond his family and classroom. But if you look at there, you dig a little deeper, deeper, there seems to be a sense of parental sanction from the father itself. It's perhaps, and I'm convinced that it is true, is that for his own theological reasons, he doesn't mind that his kid is gonna die. He doesn't mind that his kid is gonna die as a martyr or a militant or whatever. He sees merit in his kids call for jihad. And that is where the battle for mind space comes in. That's where the battle of ideas comes in. You know, I can give you a very simple example. What happened in Jammu and Kashmir is that jamaat e islami which is uh, a right-wing Muslim group, which, uh, proscribe, which is now, it seems, uh, in comparison to kind of groups that have come up, slightly less, less radical, but it is a radical group after all. And it's a radical group in Bangladesh, it's a radical group in uh, Pakistan, and uh, in India it has a totally different formation. But in Jammu and Kashmir, it is recognized as a radical group. Is that jamaat e islami its cadre, took over the education system in a very uh, infectious way. It's that the teachers, mostly, of jamaat e islami were recruited into campuses like co government colleges, universities, and so on. And they themselves set up schools to teach kids. So what they did is that from the very go, from the nursery itself, they have got a control on the, on the mind of the child and then how the society or the family is going to think about its, uh, an individual's relationship with the society. That's one. Number two, but it's, in my opinion, moved beyond that is that today, you may not need a school, for instance, to radicalize someone. Today, social media is sufficient. You know, I track these WhatsApp and Telegram and encrypted chat rooms as a part of my research as to the kind of content that comes in. You would be baffled the sheer amount of content that they produce. I mean, if you were to analyze, in a day, you would have 15, 20, 30 messages, videos, audios coming in and telling you all about this and there is no counter so in the battle of ideas you have only one idea that's coming up and I agree uh, with uh, uh, my friend on the left saying that 
it's somewhat a pop jihad and in this pop jihad there's only one image which is that of a of bravado which is of a person holding a gun and and then his idea that he is morally righteous and his idea that giving life for something for a cause is going to give him a sense of you know accomplishment in the life hereafter but for that you what we have done is that in my opinion rehabilitation is passe because once you've gotten hold of someone once he's in a detention center you've neutralized the problem it it's immaterial how you deal with that person the focus should be on prevent how do you prevent a person from taking up the arms how do you prevent a person how do you acquaint a person enough how do you educate him enough to not fall in the narrative which is a radical narrative and that conversation you can have with the state but beyond a point you do realize that it's not the state that can control it the onus comes back on the society and it's for the society to decide whether they want a 16 year or a 20 year old suicide bomber which almost took two countries to a war to be their representative or somebody else and as long as societies do not introspect and take that call i don't think we can solve this problem by having a compassionate communication i don't think economics and development has a factor pulwama is one of the most uh, 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 prosperous districts of jammu and kashmir it's the district which exports apples it's got the highest uh, share in horticulture in jammu and kashmir it's in my opinion got the highest per capita income as per the districts but it's still giving you more recruits than any other district in jammu and kashmir how do you explain that it's a district which has got a well full fledged education system it's got it may not have super uh, world class roads but it's got a functioning system so i believe economics and development they may lead to some sort of a resentment or dent the credibility of the state and the government but that in itself is not the only thing that drives uh, it's the idea it's the narrative and it's the battle in the mind space which is not getting fought which is not getting tackled so that's my submission i mean we should not see it simply these people as unemployed because when you have a phd candidate who has studied sociology mind you sociology and then becomes a militant and tells you that this is the true path and whatever i was doing there in the university i was wasting my life and if you talk about poverty if you move out of delhi beyond badarpur you see what poverty is and you see the real oppression in the society how difficult it's for them who come from the lowest strata of the society they do they're not interested in this idea it's a middle class phenomenon from my understanding it's the middle class who are well to do who have access to social media who ha who are who have access to certain uh, uh, channels of information communication they are the ones who are more vulnerable because uh, for an idea which is in syria to come uh, it, you don't understand that an idea for syria will not come to the lowest first it'll come to someone who will have access to communication and in my opinion it's the middle class so what is happening is that one our communication systems have been disrupted there is a huge ecosystem out there which is willing to take people and willing to radicalize them and influence their minds within the society and on social media and there is nobody looking at it and there's nobody countering and why i need to come back to education system is that once the education system has given you i am talking about a secular education system by the way i am not talking about a madrasa kind of an education system it's the secular education system which uh, uh, which trains you forward towards a system towards a society towards an outlook where you see yourself not as a monolith but as one among many communities and that's where you kind of start developing bridges then you communicate and then that sense of diversity also comes in um thanks kalin i have a, a the question for shanti really is that uh, in the afghanistan context um we've seen in your article you mentioned how there's a breakdown of uh, theater films and culture and sport you know not so much sport but the other things there's the theater and film industry has been destroyed in afghanistan so given the uh, you know our uh, festival and how we are you know looking at this this topic 
what would you say about uh, you know um, a revival of theater films and sport in afghanistan i think uh, it's an important question and uh, uh, changing gears from what is cv and pv to something which is tangible on the ground theater and music have had platforms in afghanistan and as you know it was during the mujahideen time and then the taliban period that it was completely banned uh, it's it's seen a revival since 2001 and that's one good sign in afghanistan so we have lot more women who are out uh, into tv shows for instance though they face death threats and some of them have even been killed they're still out there and that's a good sign so i've traveled to the provinces in afghanistan like kandahar to badakhshan and all of these places now the concern is with the dwindling of the international aid you know stopping of the money coming into this kind of radio stations run by women only that money uh, that kind of shows are getting curtailed so there is this whole downside of the international funding not looking at this aspect which was actually progress in afghanistan so there was this space created from the intervention time from 2001 to 2014 which is actually a period where the international community could have built more but unfortunately uh, since everyone wants to leave afghanistan no one wants to retain this and that's the sad story of afghanistan today sports interestingly you as you have seen like cricket i mean they have come to to a stage today that uh, india which had given them the home ground could be on the footing where they could lose a match to afghanistan so that i think is a good sign uh, if you even go to the rural areas like say uh, jalalabad you also see young kids like girls playing cricket and these were good stories and unfortunately i didn't make videos the way rahul has made but a lot of pictures of this and every time when there are bleak stories about afghanistan coming up i tend to post all this positive pictures because that space and those people are still there in that country and we are just forgetting and letting them go to the wolves because we we want to leave afghanistan we means i mean the west india is still there india is still trying to do things but i'm not sure which direction india's policy is going but that's a matter of different debate but broadly speaking if you also notice in the news it was the robotics team and and you know that afghanistan made news with that so despite all the difficulties and obstacles i think afghans have that uh, intent and they're looking for platforms and they love to come to india uh, i know of one or two afghans who have come in to bollywood as well and they're getting trained into some hindi movies and all of that so i think we need to give them that avenue so we've given them the avenue for cricket but there's so much more you could do in terms of theater and music uh in 2012 i'd gone to jalalabad with the india afghan uh, music team and i was sitting in the governor's house there and i was the only woman out there but there was this full stadium of 1000 men just listening to indian and mu uh, afghan musicians playing music sufi music and all qawalis and all of that and there was so much of interest to do more so there's always that interest to do more and there is that space but that space has not been utilized to an extent that you could change it just one more story i just want to add to this because there might be concern that if the taliban come back to power what will happen to these people who want to do theater music and all so i did interview one of the taliban commanders in kabul he had come back on a peace and reconciliation program and he was willing to talk to me so the first sign is he's willing to talk to a woman who's not really covered her head and he's ready to be photographed and uh, i asked him that during your time he was the deputy vice chief of the taliban who was in charge of breaking the tv sets and whipping women for wearing heels and lipstick so i'm sitting with this person and asking him this question that if uh, women are out in kabul uh, and they come to office and they want to study will that be still permissible to the taliban and he says yes because we see uh, afghan society has to advance and we have to do things differently so i did this interview but i was still not very sure of the change in mindset of the taliban leadership but what was a positive sign is a surrender commander comes forward with a different version now the same person who was in charge of vice and virtue so there is that space there is the there are the people there it's just a matter of bridging that gap and i think i'll take questions yeah. if there are more yeah. thank, uh, you. Th thank you thank uh, you shanti lutz um you have in your article also in the souvenir mention this uh, that uh, what could be an antidote 
uh, or uh, you know repair mechanism is a modern arab youth culture you referred to yeah. that you know very interesting so can you tell us what in your mind could be a arab uh, modern arab youth culture and how it could really help I think it's often uh, that point of looking for acknowledgement. Uh, it's a point of where you can be somebody. Uh, and I think a lot of people are going in, into their radicalization because these Muslim brothers very early start with, uh, you're, you're the brother, we shelter you, and give the acknowledgement and give, 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 give them all they need. So I think we, we try, we have to find uh, uh, parts where the people can be somebody, where they can be cool, where they have the feeling somebody sees me, I can do something. Uh, the wonderful Beyoncé said, you can't be what you can't see. So I think what we need is, is uh, that there are people where they have the feeling this is one of our guys or this is one of our girls and that's where I belong to. So it's always being, being in a group and being a part of something which is big and which is, yeah, which is, which are the cool kids and which are the kids that have the feeling now we will get in charge, we'll do something like that. Uh, uh, for example, I made a project in Paris with a school uh, in the banlieue. There was not one uh, pupil with French origin. They were all diverse. Uh, and uh, um, I just said, we make a show. And just, what, what, what do you want to do in that show? Do you want to dance? Do you want to do hip hop and whatever? And tell stories. And we just had a lot of workshops and made a, made a play out of it. And it was a mixture of uh, kind of a TV show on theater. And they were dancing, they were singing, uh, things like that. And we had an international festival of school theater, and the other groups were doing Goethe, Schiller, Shakespeare, and not one uh, black person in any of the other groups. And we came with only black people, more or less. And it was that, oh, that's interesting, we have a black people here. But it was that kind of upper middle class private school things, and they were looking at them as freaks. And I thought, oh, how will they deal with that? And they just said, fuck you, we have the best show. And I think that's the point, that they have something where nobody can tell them, uh, now we have the showtime with the black people afterwards. And they really, they have that kind of, do you call it self-esteem? Self-esteem. Self-esteem. Uh, because they said, we've written that thing, and we are dancing, we are singing, so who cares? And I think that point, to, to have as many platforms as possible, where they have that feeling of, you can't bullshit me, because I have something. Uh, and that's a point to think that, negative energy can be a constructive energy. Wonderful. So, um, taking um, a leap from there, Kirsten, in, you mentioned that um, almost 10,000 people might have seen parodies in Dusseldorf alone. So, um, does that uh, kind of encourage you to handle this theme and topic in, in the coming, let's say, two and three years? with more themes like this along these lines? Yes, of course, but, but we think the problem, we think radicalization as an issue, so not Islamistic radicalization, but radicalization. So the, I think a bigger problem we Germans right now have is, is the, um, that p many people get far right winged again, or is it an again, or is it a new movement? We don't know, no one knows. We all uh, shut our eyes, we don't really uh, act, and uh, so we try with the means of theater to come into this, and uh, again to say, uh, create spaces where people can bring their opinions on, on the table of the house, and we all uh, discuss it, so we try to also reach the people that have radicalistic ideas, and we already, I mean, Theatre is also theatre, so it doesn't have to be always on problems. But yes, we did uh, a play on uh, far right-wing radicalization, and right now we work on a book by a very young author, 24 years old, of the eastern part of Germany, and how he de describes actually his childhood, but taking two uh, figures, brothers, and how both of them slid into a radicalized situation. And it is one thing is always in common that it's always connected to the adult world. So all we together must think: what do we do? How do we uh, present ourselves? How, how uh, do young people see us? And then sometimes think that they must now act because we don't. We only we always talk. Um, so, but uh, to learn about what 
also culture could give to these issues is um, uh, I want to tell you about the groundbreaking uh, study from New York. It was just released in the, this spring and there were in, in the new Victory Theatre, a uh, children's theatre from New York. Um, they did a five-year study. They uh, uh, oh, my English is too bad. They they company. They were, went with two groups of children, and one group was connected to the theater, watching plays and doing plays themselves, and the other didn't. So they both came from precarious situations, uh, with families no work, no hope things like this, and what happened uh, that the scientists could find out is uh, something that actually being a theater waker we all know, is uh, that uh, immediately after some months, but you have to do it continuously, the, uh, the grades in school got uh, bet much better than in all the other groups. And the, th the, the most important thing I think that was found out by the scientists is something that was not part of the study, so they didn't aim to find out about this, that the group that was connected to the Cultural Institute and theatre um, created, the children developed something that um, was not into their neighbourhoods for generations anymore, and that was hope. And it meant that these children began to create a vision for their own life. To begin, they began to create a vision for their communities. And this is something even the scientists really uh, didn't believe. So they studied five years on this. So we know that we cannot do one play and the world changes but we can connect people to cultural um, ways to, cr to be able to cope with problems and to create a tolerance towards different diverse things that happen in our world. Or as you just said, you all, we all get angry at some points. Nevertheless, it doesn't mean that I become a radical. I mean, I don't know yet. Maybe I someday become a radical. I don't know. But Maybe this is because we had the luck that someone showed us a way to cope with it, to analyze. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Kirsten. I, uh, you know, uh, we've all been, uh, the panelists have been sharing their thoughts and I felt now, uh, you know, we could look at the audience and, uh, you know, go for questions. I, I would have been happy if we would have, you know, we didn't think about it, but a chit of paper and a pen and you know they could have written their questions and sent it to me it would have been better but i don't think we can do that but right now um, i think whoever wants to ask a question can raise their hand we'll pass a mic and you know um, you can you can um, direct the question at specific panelists that 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 is one way but before that i have a message from arun here who mentioned uh, Suali, yeah? Sualek, yeah. Oh, sorry, Sualek. Sualek is in the audience and, and uh, Arun tells me that he survived radicalization and he, he, may, he might want to share his thoughts. So, we'll just give you, uh, Sualek will give you a mic. One minute. Yeah, at the outset, I would like to say that uh, before we talk about uh, youth and radicalization, we should define what radicalization is. Because uh, according to some dictionaries, it, the, the, the definition that I read sounds positive. Like there are many words that in the West have a positive connotation, but in India and elsewhere, they might have a negative one. Just like communalism, where it's a very wholesome thing where you think about the benefiting your community and all. But out here it has a different, it has a animosity and hatred, that kind of a connotation. Anyway, that apart, uh, what uh, but I mean by that is that, you know, if we look at it, the cross section or whatever this thing, somewhere there's a elephant which is uh, invisible in the room. The elephant in the room is that we have not even named that properly. The, title of this conference is Youth and Radicalization, but if we look at all the stories, there is a common thread among them of a particular religion to which I also belong to. So, 
what I mean to say that we should start out by speaking very clearly in no ambiguous, no virtue signaling, no uh, political correctness. Because until we identify and diagnose things properly, we will not be uh, able to come up with a prescription. Like I most wholeheartedly agree with my friend Khalid Shah when he said that it's not lack of education, it's not lack of governance or development and there's a whole lot of thing that brings this explosive mix and allows uh, the minds of you to be hijacked. So I agree with him also that once somebody is, uh, let's call it infected, there's nothing hardly we can do except to quarantine that person so that he doesn't spoil others or you know his circle. And uh, in that sense, I would say that we have to concentrate on education of children instead of dealing with adults like Dulat style, okay, let's say it, have kebab and goshtaba and you know, like, okay, I will give you money if you withdraw this agitation or something like that. No, that's not the way to deal with it. Those people need to be quarantined. As regards the children, there are three things that I feel is very important to teach to them which will make them self-sufficient and uh, they don't need anybody's help then to protect themselves from, uh, they develop their own immunity towards this mind virus. So one thing what uh, you talked about, community, communication and uh, compassion. Yeah, empathy. Empathy is like, empathy is like, for example, let, let me give you a scenario that Somebody is walking by, few people are walking by, they witness somebody, a dog or a man or somebody lying on the road, you know, not, uh, you know, like maybe in an accident or bleeding or maybe shot down or whatever. So there are many ways that there are some children who will say that, you know, hey, look at that and they will be so, oh, look, look how horrible. So that comes to that, how parenting. In Kashmir, because we have to constantly protect our children from being, uh, you know, headhunted by these uh, recruitment, uh, you know, motivators and all. So we have to teach children compassion. That it doesn't matter if somebody is, uh, you know, uh, so that there's a lot of element of racism a sense of superiority because of uh, skin color and all that kind of a thing in Kashmir. I'm talking with specific context to Kashmir here. So there's an element of racism and all. So you will hardly find people who will say that, you know, poor soldier, he was hurt. No. There is an othering, there is a looking down upon as if they are subhuman. So you, it starts out by giving names like dogs, snakes or things like that. So once you dehumanize that, then after that you can, uh, you know, uh, justify any atrocity on that kind of a person because they deserve it, they're not even human and all that. Uh, so surely one, is, one, sorry to interrupt. There are three I, things I wanted to talk but about. But what I was keen you share with us hmm. is how it affected you personally. That, no. No? No. <laughs> I, because uh, I thought Arun I, told me that... I'm, a, I'm like uh, one of those self-styled Kashmir experts, so I do a lot of research. And I'm from that society and I'm older than him, so I've seen a longer phase. But I agree with him wholeheartedly, whatever he's saying. Okay, the second thing that yeah. has to be done is that they have to be, the children have to be taught naturalism. Naturalism, why would that be important? Naturalism is that so that they have a law, uh, they don't uh, resort to supernatural explanations of ordinary things like earthquakes, no. It is not the girls wearing jeans that is causing all the earthquakes. Just giving a funny example, this naturalism is very important because people who are superstitious, despite their uh, so-called uh, normal education. So, yeah. So the p people who uh, resort to supernatural explanations of this thing, they can commit any atrocity because they don't have those logic gates to see it in perspective. So if you tell tomorrow somebody in Pakistan that, you know, there is no electricity here, there is no water here because India is drawing out electricity so the water that flows into Pakistan does not, has no longer any electricity left in it. They don't have the concept of potential energy, this thing, that thing. So they can believe anything. 
So if you teach nationalism, this thing, they will not play, uh, believe anything. They will be very careful in what comes, they will become skeptical. And uh, I have seen now nowadays children are becoming like that. If you tell them something, they will say, wait a second, and they will Google it to check whether you are talking, you know, yes, pulling. Third thing is, first was empathy and compassion. Second is the natural naturalism. Third thing is critical thinking. Now, I, I uh, in my daily life, I meet uh, some hundreds of people and talk to a lot of people from my place. From my, I find that there are there's a severe dearth of critical thinking in the educational system because it's more oriented towards uh, examination, degree, and that kind of a thing. So what happens is that uh, there are people I come across who, in a single breath, say that 9-11 was an inside job. And in the second sentence, he says that Osama bin Laden taught America a lesson. Now, how can both be correct simultaneously? They don't have that faculty. So whatever they become in a conflict state, you don't want to take this thing. So they start repeating everything that is floating around and regurgitating as their own because they lose that rigor, that this thing, to filter out that if it is their inside job, then he's not there, uh, he's not, he didn't do anything. So why are you praising him or uh, offering Nimazi Jinaza to him in absentia because he taught this thing? So that's what I, so this is more about how to deal with it. So my, yeah. this thing is adults, they are gone cases. Yeah. Children, they are our future. Sure, like, so thank you for this uh, intervention. Thank you. Um, Bipin uh, Deshpande, I think, had a question there. So you'll need the mic. <clears throat> no, I'll, one second. <clears throat> yeah, we could keep that mic in the audience, perhaps. Yeah. So Bipin, uh, if you want to specifically address it to a panelist, do that. And Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, my question is in two parts. One is uh, regarding the Afghanistan situation. So right now, we've had discussions about um, disturbed states having a lot of radicalism. Yeah? Um, a country you have to like speak, uh, keep the mic close to your... Yeah. A country like Afghanistan, for example, uh, is disturbed just as Kashmir is. And so you have radicalization. And just now, we're talking about the Taliban taking charge in a few years to come or in the near future. Will it in any way make any difference to the levels of radicalization? Yeah, uh, because then the uh, uh, the system is in in support of the local people. There is no external interference. A lot of the factors which affect or supposedly affect rad radical uh, radicalization are removed, so to say. Secondly, my question is to our friends from Germany. Uh, whenever I see an Islamic state or a country which supports Islam or says they are an Islamic state, you always see the crescent. The majority, and, and that crescent, is in a way seen as a bit of a threat by those who are from non-Islamic countries. And my question to, or my observation, is that a large, a very large number of European and um, uh, Christian states have a cross on their flag. And it's almost as though there is somebody waving a crescent here and someone else waving a cross there. There is also an increase in the number of anti-Semitism of late. And they are as radical as anybody else. They're just not in a situation where they um, propagate or, or uh, uh, you know, you see the effects of that radicalization on the ground. Just a thought in case someone so, can... So, Bipin, let me clarify. Your first question is to Shanti. Yes. And that question is that in the present uh, peace talks that are happening in, in the Middle East... So, um, post-settlement post of those talks, once the Taliban is actually in government, yeah, which is what they're trying to do, would it reduce radicalization in any way? Okay. You, yeah. you, could you hear, hear that? Yeah. Well, uh, the peace talks are on, but the Taliban is not back in the government yet. Uh, the elections which are going to be held on September 28th, the presidential elections. What we are envisaging is a kind of a peace deal which could be worked out between the United States and the Taliban, by which the Taliban could come back in some form, but that's not really acceptable to the Afghans. One, because the Afghan government is not involved in the peace talks. Second, there's huge opposition from the women 
the young people and the educated lot, and they have their own social media platforms called Red Lines. So there is opposition within Afghanistan itself for the Taliban coming back. So in this scenario, if the Taliban have to come back through any kind of an agreement, uh, which could be done either before the elections, because once the elections are held, the Taliban are not going to come to power. There would be some kind of a restraining power on them of not, do, not being able to do what they did in the 1990s. So that is the only way they can have the Taliban back, because Afghan society has progressed to such an extent that the women have been able to come out and use various platforms, say from the Hollywood again to the media, to various conferences, to being very vocal. And the last interesting thing is that they're actually sitting in Doha and talking to Taliban. So I did ask a woman MP who was uh, who is from Badakhshan, a strong opponent of the Taliban before, but now talking to the Taliban that why are you doing so? She says basically because the central government doesn't talk to us. The government in Kabul is not talking to us. So we'll talk to anyone who's opposing the government in Kabul. So this is a, actually a stalemate situation what we're seeing in Afghanistan, wherein uh, the central government's credibility has eroded to a considerable extent. So if you don't have elections, there's no government in place. And if a deal is worked out, a deal can be imposed without a government in place, which means it's not legitimate by itself, but which will be made acceptable by having an election at a later date. So it's a pretty complicated situation at the, at the moment, but it's not a bleak situation as yet. Because if the Taliban have to come back to power, they will not be in that major number as they were in the 1990s. And they might not be able to do things which they do, did in 1990s. So I think that is one factor. So uh, talking about your question about radicalization now, as I mentioned before, there are these two camps which have emerged. One is the Taliban and one is the Islamic State, which are fighting. And because of the fighting between the two, the violence levels have peaked in Afghanistan. So what appears to the Afghans is that the Taliban are the good boys now and the Islamic State is the bad boys. So there's a distinction which has evolved. Within the Taliban ranks itself, there is a fear that if they stop fighting before the peace deal, there will be a degeneration that the, they lose the fighters. So they will not stop fighting. So the fighting will continue. So having studied this insurgency for some time, it, it's very evident that the leadership of the Taliban, which is based in Pakistan, will continue the fight with, through various networks. Because the Taliban is not a monolithic insurgency. There are various factions within the Taliban now. You have Al-Qaeda, you have the Haqqani network, you have the, uh, the Gulbuddin uh, Hekmatyar, and various factions have joined the Taliban insurgency. So even if the mid-level and the lower-level commanders come to some deal and are sitting in Kabul, the leadership which is based outside the country will continue the fight. So thereby the radicalization will not be impacted just by having Taliban back in Kabul in any form. So, so my, my question is slightly different. It, it will decrease the number of foot soldiers, but it will not uh, have direct impact on the radicalization. Simple for the fact that I mentioned that the key drivers, that is the economic factors, are driving this youth. Now, in the Indian case, it's very different. Uh, other theaters are very different. And I've edited a book on this subject on countering violent extremism in South and Southeast Asia. So one size fits all approach doesn't work. What you look in Afghanistan is very different from what you're looking at Pakistan and India. So these are case study approaches. So when you're looking at preventing the uh, extremism per se, I think we have to avoid generalization. And thereby this whole issue of you know definitions come up. Radicalization, how do you define terrorism? So far, we don't even have a universal defi uh, definition of terrorism. So there are the problems of you know, defining radicalization, of who are the ones who are actually joining these extremist groups, and how do you actually prevent them from joining? So having Taliban back in some form is not, uh, uh, is not preventive per se, but it could reduce the levels inside Afghanistan. But that might not impact in Pakistan because the Islamic State potential remains and the fighting will continue. And the drivers which are driving these people, basically it's uh, edu uh, education and economic, and the lack of access to justice because governance is a complete failure in Afghanistan, will be a fodder for these people so, to join. So my question here is, that, that is why I'm relating it to the situation in Europe where education or standard of living is really not a problem. Yeah, yeah? exactly. And when you have situations or people who are, let's say, anti-Semitic, yeah, and that is coming up. But you, you look in terms of the numbers here. 
Do you think well, the numbers in the Gulf are as much as in Afghanistan? No, I'm Why? saying that the, the, the uh, target over here as being anti-Semitic in, in, in many European states today, uh, and it is coming up slowly, but definitely, um, there is no issue with the, with, with the Jews today. You know, so I'm just trying to understand how is this whole thing happening? Uh, you know, so there is education, there is uh, a standard of living, and to me, they are as radical as anybody else. So that's why I'm emphasizing on a case study approach because one, uh, there no, there's not a single causal theory of why individuals get radicalized. It's a whole combination of the social, economic, psychological uh, issues. And that has not been studied in a whole of society approach. What we have been looking at has been from a whole of, uh, whole of government approach. It has been more in terms of a top-down approach. We have not paid attention to the details of why, for instance, there was this guy in Bangalore who was a 24-year-old techie who was tweeting for the Islamic State. And Channel uh, 4 from London was the first one to break out the story that this guy is sitting in Bangalore and tweeting for Islamic State. So why would he do that? He had a good job in the IT sector. His family was well off. He was well educated. So you know, these are different causal factors which you don't understand how it works. One is the mind space theory, one is the economic. And for me, studying Afghanistan, I see it as economic because they don't have the basics and they have no other options at the moment. But so the percentage of that would be higher than someone who's just joining because they get influenced or they are, uh, they are willing to address a sense of loss of identity or you know, to reinforce the identity. That's what I think is mostly happening in the Western societies, where the alienation and a loss of sense of identity and a need for having a purpose is more important. OK. OK. Um, Aj Ajay, uh, and then Milindia. Ajay is right in front. Thank you. Um, if I were a young Muslim male today. Just keep that mic a little closer. OK, sorry. If I were a young Muslim male today, whether I was living in Germany or in Jammu or in Afghanistan or wherever, if I were to listen to both traditional media, social media, I would feel like my religion and my people are under siege uh, just because of what you see. So I'm not, so I, my question really is, is there a role for moderate Muslim thinkers and peace-loving Muslim people, talking to your point about the elephant in the room, what is there a role for them to play in this process, for Muslim society to play in this process? And if there is, what is that role? OK, so I think Arun and Khalid both want to respond to that. Sure. So I think the version of Islam that is being used the version of Islam that is being used to drive radicalization through social media and propaganda and all that is not really Islam. If you really look at the essence of Islam, the purest form of Islam, it is very, very different from what goes under the name of Islam. The same with Hinduism. Sometimes what goes under the garb of Hinduism is not pure Vedanta. Same with Christianity or and so on. So I think there's a need for people who really understand to come together and bring forward aggressively, enthusiastically, and energetically the purest form of Islam, the purest form of Hinduism. And when you do that, you find that it's deep down, it's all the same thing. There's compassion, there's love, there's peace, right? So we have to be very, very conscious of the pure versions of Islam versus what is touted as Islam in the name of Wahhabism or, or you know, somebody who's using Islam as a political tool or an ideological tool or a tool for violence. So we have to be very careful about that. I have a slightly different uh, response to that. You know, for a moderate Muslim, what, is, what should he do? First, in my opinion, he should speak the truth, his truth, number one. Number two, is that he should, in my opinion, I don't know what your idea of a moderate Muslim is, my idea of a moderate Muslim is someone who has made peace with modern world and who has made peace with modernity. And by modernity, I don't mean technology or I don't mean uh, gadgets and wearing a suit or something like that. 
I mean the ideals on which uh, the modern world is based upon, the ideas of individuality, the idea of uh, democracy, the idea of secularism, of peaceful coexistence. It's the idea of human rights, the idea of uh, my way is not the highway, it can never be the highway. And it's only when you settle these debates in your mind is that you become moderate, is that, you know, I walked into the hotel and I could have created a big scene out of it. I walked into the hotel, I saw a copy of Bhagavad Gita out there and I was a little surprised. First time in my life I walked into a hotel and I found a religious book. This hasn't even happened to me in Kashmir. So what did I do? I picked it up and I started reading it. So, you know, that's where you, you know, when you develop that tolerance for the other, the other will also start developing mm -hmm. that tolerance for you. It's a mirror reflection. I don't mind having Bhagavad Gita on my bed and sleeping besides it because it doesn't make any difference to my faith. My faith is between me and my God. And that's what my religion tells me. And as long as we do not, and in my opinion, the radicals or the not moderate, as you call them, are the ones who have not made peace with modernity. And it's a tussle between the modern ideas and medieval ideas, which is fundamentally at the crux of this entire debate that we are having. Thank you. Yeah, lovely responses by Arun and Khalid. Thank you very much. Uh, Milind, you have a question? Yeah. As my friend here said, are we not being politically correct in not pinpointing the I word here, the Islamic, the pos possibility of Islam being the cause? Are we trying to pussyfoot on this or are we trying to maybe make this some kind of a beauty contest where we talk the politically correct things? Because somewhere, radicalization, because what, Mr. what he was talking about is Islamic radicalization as a Muslim youth. I don't know why he had to come with a Hindu counter to it. He could have just spoken about Islam, spoken about it right or wrong. Are you getting me? My point is, why are we not belling the cat or facing the truth in the sense of really coming out, as the techie said, as the techie in Bangalore, they said, where does this come from? It doesn't come from uh, just the air, let us understand. It doesn't come from vacuum. Where does it come from? As a friend here said, somewhere I believe we are pussyfooting on this. Why are we doing it? Uh, Milan, are you directing it to any specific panelist, generally? To Arun and Khalid? And, and you're, let it, uh, have you all heard the question correctly? Yeah. So, so just for the larger audience, what you're trying to say is, uh, why are we pussyfooting on? On, uh, let us say, belling the cat, trying to say where the problem really starts from. Sorry? Where the problem really is. Okay, you mean, uh, Milan, let me get that right. What you're trying to say is, you feel that, that the problem has not been identified clearly? I believe you know it, you're not talking about it. That's exactly what my friend here said. So, what you're trying to say, sir, what's your name, sir? Milan, Milanji, what you're saying is, if I've understood you right, is the problem is really Islam. Right? I think that's, that's what you're saying. Now, I would like to say to you, the problem is people who are rational, who have empathy, who have compassion, who love peace, versus those who are evil, who are irrational, who are violent, who are... Uh, caught up in their mind and it has nothing to do with religion, sir. I can show you people from Islam who are pure-hearted, who are warm and so on, very kind, very loving. And I can also show you people from Islam who are the other side. I can say the same with Christianity, with Judaism, with Hinduism, with any religion in the world. Now come to, let's say, Pakistan and India. One of the biggest problems we have is generalization. Every Pakistani is like that, or every Muslim is like that. I think there are three things that cut away at truth, three things. Deletion, distortion, and generalization. So let's not generalize. I think the battle, the real battle is between peace, rationality, democracy, secularism, compassion for all, coexistence, harmony, 
versus those who don't want that. And I think it cuts right across religions, it cuts across nations, it has nothing to do with one particular religion and so on. That's all, I and mean, that's the truth as I see it. Yeah, thank you, Arun, a very good explanation. Khalid? You know, as I said earlier, I'd like to repeat it, is that I think the answer to your question is in my previous answer, which is that what do I believe in? And what is my belief, how does my belief hamper my relationship with the outside world? You know, when you start making that rationalization between the two and you realize that, let me just put it this way, you are saying that the problem is with Islam. I'm saying that it's not the problem with Islam, it's the problem with the people who are practicing Islam. It's my belief is that, okay, there may be some verses which you may think are problematic. I say, okay, I don't want to talk about it. I want to talk about democracy. For instance, somebody comes to me and tells me, oh, we don't have to live in the system, we should live in an Islamic system. I say, how does it change my life? My belief is between me and my God. And when I, what I mean to say, when I say that, that I need to make peace with modernity is exactly what you're trying to tell me, is that Christianity has moved beyond that. They've made that peace with modernity, is now they've come here. And I believe we need to do the same. We may not choose the same path, we may not choose the same dictum and same method, but at the end of the day, we have to decide whether we want to live in the medieval age or we want to live in a postmodern world. And to live in a postmodern world, in my opinion, is, is not what is text or what is context, is also about what is current and what is present. And that current and present becomes all the more important. So you can keep saying that, oh, there's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem. Of course, there's problem in every book. If you read the Old Testament, it'll make you, it'll make your guts wrench when you read it. But the idea is to move beyond that and maybe find a new meaning to it or maybe find a new way of looking at things. That's where I think the reality changes and that's where I think the real reform comes in. The real reform doesn't come in rejecting the old. The real reform comes in moving beyond the old. Can I give a counter on that? Sorry? Can I counter that again? Uh, no, before that, uh, Shanti also wants to add to the discussion. Uh, well, I think uh, Khalid talked about practicing religion. I would actually talk about the interpretation of religion. And I think that's been a problematic here because uh, extremism exists in every form of religion. And uh, for my study in Afghanistan, what I see is that it has been the interpretation which has been problematic. So there is this moderate Islam called Sufi, which is very much existent in the region and which has not been used. And now Afghan government is using that. Uh, if you again look at case studies, Singapore has used it very well. They have a significant Muslim population and the mullahs uh, in uh, conjunction with the Singaporean government have devised their own strategies of preventing violent extremism. So it is a matter of interpretation. And uh, again in Malaysia, there's another community where we can learn lessons from of how the mullahs are working with the state of preventing this radicalization and extremism to take roots. So there are different approaches and so thereby just, I think it's more a function of the interpretation and there again, I think we have not really understood Islam or studied it thoroughly. And that's a gap I think we need to address. And I think you should look within India. India, the Indian Muslims outside of Jammu and Kashmir, think of them. How many recruits has India given to ISIS in your opinion? How many? No, that, that wouldn't matter. No, that's matter. important. That's no, important that's not because important in because my opinion, when Great Britain and Germany and United States of America and Maldives and Bangladesh, who are smaller nations, are giving thousands of recruits, you're giving 125. And that is where my answer is. That was in my initial presentation, which I made uh, uh, initially, was that syncretic culture is the bulwark against radicalization. And it's the syncretic culture here, which in my opinion has stop those floodgates, the c control is within the society, the control is within the believer, it's within the practicer. 
you can change the faith but you cannot change what a person believes in you can, you may tomorrow want to say that okay i have a totally and there have been instances where the quran has been rewritten and said that oh this is how it should be but people didn't believe in that what did people eventually believe in is what is important and if you take the context of india for instance you have a great example of how to deal with radicalization you you have an important example to understand how two religions can live peacefully largely there may be differences there may be upheavals but if you look the la if you look at the long uh, uh, trajectory of history i think we are doing much better than other countries which have such big number of muslims maybe barring jammu and kashmir where you find a problem and i in my opinion the uh, reason for that problem is not merely faith but it's also geopolitics and the intermingling of the geopolitics in the faith uh, in my opinion somewhat true for afghanistan as well but it things can't be simplified and narrowed down on one thing is what i say is it you may want to look at things from different angles and eventually come to a conclusion that maybe yes there may be something wrong with something but it's also with the person who's believing in that wrong now we'll take one last question and um, that is from the young gentleman there behind milind yeah thank you um i um uh, i found the the approach of uh, asking us how we be cautious not to pussy foot something uh, i'm i don't i'm not so familiar with the phrase but i assume it's about not being too timid in approaching the the being timid in approaching this whole problem and i found i find this uh, question very interesting though i think um i i'm wondering if we may have a misunderstanding because i think all of us are very um aware of the problem and very much in discern not to underestimate it but we see the the uh, the root of the problem in a very very different place and i i have the feeling that the 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 our five experts on stage who really encountered it day to day in a very um concrete form are um really uh, talking the truths uh, but i want to to ask to ask this question also how do we make sure that this tiny minority who tries to uh, seed hate and fear uh, in our uh, society and who try to um uh, uh, who try to um, overestimate themselves or to to try make us overestimate the terrorists how can we be um forthcoming making sure that we always know that the the loving side the people who want peace democratic uh, environments for us and our children how can we make sure that we know that we are the bigger community and the the a mightier community or maybe a, a stronger community no, just i think thank you for raising that the majority of people are passive the majority of people who care for peace are passive so if you have active uh, active and passive positive and negative most of the population will come into passive positive so the challenge is how do we mobilize all of us to be active and positive i think that is the challenge and but one of the ways is to find people who are already sparked to work with leaders to develop leadership develop the youth develop the children the women and and work with them to raise their voices i think that's would you like to add anything i think uh, you know what we 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 i think run out of time very badly i'm sure there are many other questions what could be done is as we break off now you can always as we step out really because we are concluding today's uh, um, wonderful sessions but you can always ask uh, uh, offline you know any any of the panelists what you all but we'll we'll close it now because we almost hit 9 o'clock so thank you very much uh, for being a good audience and uh, i appreciate the i would like to thank the panelists for some very wonderful thoughts and articulation thank you
So on behalf of Maharashtra Cultural Center, I thank all the panelists and I also thank Rahul Chandavarkar for conducting this fantastic session. I hope every one of us uh, has kind of got a lot of information, a lot of insight, and this will kind of change us at least a little bit in our approach towards radicalization. Thank you so much. Good night. And tomorrow we have a performance of the play, Paradise, here. So I invite all of you to attend the play. Thank you. Thank you.